right, let's pray together. Good morning, Lord. We're so glad to be in your presence. And we're so glad to be together with one another, sisters in the Lord. Thank you for your love and waking us up again this morning, that you have grace for us, Lord, that you're looking down with love upon us and your heart's desires to draw us close to you. And we just want responsive hearts. So we pray your Holy Spirit would work in us to respond to you, to hear from you, to know when you're speaking something to us very personally this morning. And I just pray with all my heart, your Holy Spirit would just work within us, showing us, Lord, your precious word. I pray that it would just seep deep in our soul. Thank you, Lord, for providing this psalm to, to tell us who you really are and to tell us who we are in you. Uh, thank you for it, Lord. Bless our hearts, bless our ears, and Lord, bless my mouth. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Awesome, good to see you guys this morning. We, of course, are in Psalm 139, and so go ahead and open up your Bibles to that. Um, last week, we really took a look at the omnipresent nature of God, and that was, that was what was highlighted in our passage. And then this week, um, we're going to be going through verses 13 through 18, and it's going to shed light on God as our creator. And so let's read our portion together, Psalm 139, starting in verse 13. 13. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Ooh, isn't this the best passage? I love it. Let's look at verses 13 and 14 first. You have formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Do you remember being told about the birds and bees? Let's go back in our memories a little bit. The story of the birds and the bees, maybe your parents told you the story, or maybe you learned it at school. That's really prevalent today. Uh, maybe your brother or sister or friend told you that is scary because <laughs> you don't know what you might really get out of that conversation. I remember my mom sharing the details with me about how a baby came into the world. And basically, I was like, la, 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 la. <laughs> I don't want to hear this. I'm not ready for this. Why are you telling me this? It was like, you know the word awkward? That word fits right there. <laughs> it's just awkward feeling when they share those intimate details with you and you don't really feel ready for them. But it is great when a parent does it rather than having some kid on the schoolyard tell you stuff. It really was much later that I comprehended the, the miracle and the beauty of burgeoning new life. And it really was when my, I was pregnant with my daughter that I realized this is miraculous. This is the most wonderful thing. It's beyond words. It's quite the experience. Now, the common perception today that's presented in textbooks within media is that life arose from non-life, right? Life arose from non-life in a pool of chemicals that about 3.8 billion years ago <laughs> claimed by evolutionists that life was formed at, and it was really a result of chance, and time and natural processes. And that's the claim of evolutionists. In other words, life was just merely a cosmic accident. I honestly believe that this teaching of life being just this accident is one of the reasons why the children and the young adults coming up today who have been fed this and who are living it and believing it are very confused. When you have no sense of purpose, I'm just an accident. 
There was no plan to all of this. That leads to a lot of confusion. It leads to emptiness. I believe that we're seeing the results of that today. Of course, evolution is just a theory. There's nothing about it whatsoever that's proven, um, but it is taught mostly as a fact. But I assert to you that to bring into creation something as complex as the human body, as the magnificent DNA um, code that, was, that organized our body, could only have a, occurred by intelligent design. Do I have any amens about that? Amen. amen. God in his word tells us that creation, that is all, everything that was created, not man-made, but created originally, um, which is all of our resources, how anything else was ever done or built or made, and of course, human life, it's a witness of himself. It is an evidence that he exists, that he is real, that he is alive, that he is involved and that we are without excuse in believing that he is not alive. Romans 1, 19 and 20, and most of us know it so well. This is kind of a cool version. What may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. God's creation cries out, I am here. I am here. I made you. I created you, and I gave you this life. And just by his creation, man will be without an excuse that they did not believe in him. The fact the for, that the formation of the DNA code ultimately has to come from an infinite source of information. Cosmic goop could not have done this. Is it testifies that there is a creator. Since no human was present at the time to assemble all these living cells, it's a further testimony to an all-wise creator. Not to mention a God of creative genius. I mean, I can just look at a flower and go, this is unbelievable what I'm seeing here. The shades, the shapes, the colors, the parts, the, it, just that. Then you go into the ocean and you see all these funky, wild creations and the colors. And then I just look in this room and I look at your faces completely, uniquely different shaped and formed, every size, different eyes, different hair color, fake hair. <laughs> Even God helped that happen. I give him credit. <laughs> Die. He, he helped us have that. <laughs> but it speaks so loud of a God who is very real and who is a genius. For you have formed me. You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. For I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The story of who created us is always the same. God created us. God created you. God, I want to see your faces. God created you. He created you. Now, I'm going to share several scenarios that are possibilities of how you may have been brought into this world. The story of how each of us were brought into this world, they differ significantly. My kids loved hearing the story about how they came into the world. I, they would ask to hear it, and I would love to share it with them. And all of them differ. So here's a few ideas. Well, one is that you had two very loving parents who waited to be intimate this story's getting rarer. <laughs> Until they were married, and then in time, you came along. And so that's a beautiful way to come into the world. But in the end, God created you. Maybe you had two parents who didn't wait <laughs> until they were married, but yet they had you, and they brought you into this world. No matter how that happened, God created you. Maybe your parents were pregnant, but they couldn't keep you. Just what was happening in their life made that just an impossibility. And so 
they blessed some adoptive parents and brought, they brought you into their family. Doesn't matter. God's still the one that created you. <laughs> Maybe your mama couldn't carry you in her womb. Maybe a surrogate carried you instead. But you know what I'm going to say, right? God still created you. Maybe you were born through a process of, of something that was significantly traumatic. Maybe you were a child of rape. Maybe you were born of incest. Maybe you carry this horrible shame. It's a secret. You don't tell people your birth story because it just feels humiliating that this is the way you came into the world. But I have something to tell you. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Nothing. Because why? God created you. That is our ultimate truth of a birth story. We all have a unique birth story, but ladies, how you were brought into this world is the same. You were thought of. You were planned. You were shaped. You were designed. You were not an afterthought. Before the beginning of time, Creator God thought of you and birthed you into his heart. No matter what human interaction took place, before all of that, God created you. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Fearfully means to inspire reverence or godly fear or awe. My creation, your creation, is awesome. It should bring awe to your heart about your God. Wonderfully means unique. It refers to the fact that there is no one else, no one else like you. You are literally one of a kind and cannot be replicated. Marvelous are your works means extraordinary. The, the accomplishment of who you are in all of your DNA, in all of your beauty, in all of your shape and design is extraordinary. But not only is it that, it's difficult and beyond human power to accomplish. People didn't do this. God did. The expositor John Gill writes, No man has cause, and no woman, by the way, either, to reproach her parents for making him thus, but on the contrary should praise the Lord, as David did, who has given, his, given him life and breath in all things. I know as women that we have a lot of things we don't like about ourselves, and I bet if we were to ask, you could come up with a list real quick. I hate this, I hate that, and, you know, I hate my thighs and the fat around my knees. I mean, I, you know, was, when I was about 10, I no longer had beautiful legs. <laughs> I mean, it just happened that fast. And, you know, do I wish I could change that? Yeah, I wish I could change that, but this is the way God created me. Those are the knees he gave me, you know? Some things we're not meant to fight against and just we're meant to be different. And it's a, it really is a proclamation to the giant heart of God that he didn't go, I only select women who are blondes. You know, I only love women who are five foot six. You know, I only love brown eyes. You know, I only love a certain color skin. God's just going, no, man, I'm this big. I love variety. I purposely made you all so different. And I love you the same. We all have a right in the Lord to say this. I'm his favorite. I want to hear you say it and mean it from your heart. I'm his favorite. Look at each other. I'm his favorite. We're going to start a war. Because in the Lord God, we literally can say that, and it can be true. We are literally all his favorites. And then it says, that my soul knows very well that I was fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. That my soul knows very well. Ladies, does your soul, soul know it? Does your soul know that you were planned in the heart of God? Does your soul know that you were loved into existence by the God of the universe? Does your soul know that you are absolutely beautiful just the way God made you? 
and that when you were born, he said, it is very good. It is very good. Father, seep this into our souls. Seep it into our very being. Wrap it around us like a blanket, Father, that we know that your plan, your creation within me, within you, was perfect in your eyes. In the days of doubt, in the days of our failures, when self-hate is just lurking right around the corner, or even when the devil or man tries to tell us otherwise, you were always wanted, you will always be wanted by God. He formed you, he loves you, amen and amen. The end to that story. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought into the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. So once again, David points out that God's eyes were upon us. We've been learning that he sees us at all times. And when we were being formed in, the, his, in our mother's wombs, he was watching. It says that um, it uses the word frame. He saw our frame. That is our bones being strengthened. That is the actual Hebrew definition. He saw our bones being strengthened. Skillfully wrought is one Hebrew word, meaning embroidered needlework with variegate, variegate or mixed colors. Embroidered needlework with variegate or mixed colors. Skillfully wrought. Some translate, some versions translate this as woven. You were woven. But the first definition given is embroidery. Now, I just happen to be a hand embroiderer. Can you believe it? <laughs> I learned when I was really young, and it was just my own desire to learn to do it. My mom was a lefty, and I was a righty, so it, we, it just was not the same trying to work with her. Everything she did was very different. And so she's like, go to the neighbor across the street and let her teach you. <laughs> So I took, she, my mom bought me a little hoop and my first little, you know, uh, piece to work. And I went over there and the lady across the street began to teach me some really basic embroidery stitches. And then just over the years, I would pick it up and do some more. And I've done it with yarn and I've done it even with silk ribbon now. But it's just something I really enjoy. And I will admit, I'm getting a little arthritis in there <laughs> from all that sewing. So I know a little bit about it. I'm going to tell you what I know. When you are working embroidery, you are face planted in your project. You're holding a hoop in this hand, unless you have it on a stand, but I typically do it by hand. Holding a hoop and you are right there. You are working every stitch and you don't take your eye off that stitch. It's gotta go in the right place, it's gotta come up the right place, it has to have the right tension to make it beautiful. So you really work up close, hands-on with this style of sewing. And I want you to picture all of that with God in his creation of you, because that's what it says. You are a fine project in his hand. Now, of course, it takes years to get better and better and, and really be great at being a, an embroiderer, um, but God didn't have to practice. <laughs> He was uh, able to make a masterpiece the first time out when he created Adam and Eve and then on and on. Great attention to detail, great attention to patterns and decorative design. That's part of what makes every piece of embroidery a masterpiece in every individual. And I even brought one of my pieces with me, with me here. Um, this is a what you call a crazy quilt. I'll stand up and try to show it to you. I don't know what sides up or down or whatever, but this is kind of a wall hanging size, crazy quilt. It's not crazy because I made it <laughs> or just because the design is crazy, but it, it's actually a style of quilt. So you can see how it's sort of patchy looking. And then I just, of course, this is not a completed work, but I have stitchery all over it. And literally it represents so many styles of st stitchery. And so I wanted to share with you, and I'll even pass this around. Here you guys go. You can look at it or look at it during group time if you want. Jump back up here. There are so many stitches to create 
a beautiful work of embroidery. And then each pattern requires different stitches, but there's the running stitch, the back stitch, the split stitch, the satin stitch, the French knot, the chain stitch. Uh, there are lazy daisies, which are super cute, and I believe I have some of those on there. There's the feather stitch, which really does look like a feather. Um, there's the blanket stitch, which you see a lot of times going around a blanket at the, at the edges. There's the bullion knots, which I definitely have some of those within there. Uh, that's just to mention a few of the stitches that there are. Think about all of those stitches, and now think about God stitching you together, each and every part, every aspect of your being, how personally you were made how personally God selected your eyes. Now, I know that we might look about like our parents too, and that was part of his plan. Um, but yet, do you look exactly like any parent? I don't care how much of a mini-me you have. You are you, and there's no one like you in the world. He goes on to say that we are skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now, this is very poetic, and it's a way of saying that you were placed in a very secure place, a quiet place, kind of a secret world to develop. And, of course, that secret world is your mother's womb. <laughs> it's a whole little world in there where the baby's being grown. And so it's the same idea as David spoke of in verse 13. We're placed in our mother's womb. Verse 16 says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. The Hebrew text for this single phrase, my substance being yet unformed, it's actually one word. Isn't it amazing how many words they use, uh, we use of ours to say, they use one word to say it. This word is golem, golem, which means this is really cool. The still, unformed, embryonic mass. One word, golem. The still, unformed, embryonic mass. Reading this, we can clearly see that life begins at conception. There's no word of a heartbeat here. Um, it's, there's no limbs mentioned of it here. It's just an embryonic mass. And what we see in this is God's omnipotent power of creation, even before a mother could possibly know she's pregnant, God is in that womb creating a baby. God knows. He knows the moment of creation, boom, and he's at work. He never gasps. He's never shocked. He never coils in fear because babies are a part of God's plan. And each baby, at any stage of formation, doesn't matter what stage it is, it is a life. It is a life. And if a baby does not survive this world for any reason at all, he or she is created in God's image and therefore will be taken to heaven straight away to its heavenly Father where he is prepared a home for it. For eternity. And that is meant to bring peace to our hearts, to know that no baby is wasted with God. No baby is nothing. No baby is disposable. No baby is trash. They are life that he brought into the world, and he will be faithful to care for those babies. Now, I want to go back to an important teaching that's really found within our passage, and that is namely, God is our creator. He is the creator and maker of the universe and the people that are ever born into it. His ability to create is part of his um, omnipotent, all-powerful nature. Today, the truth that God is creator has become foolishness in our society, isn't it? I mean, people treat us like we're dumb. <laughs> You're a bunch of dumb rednecks if you believe that. I mean, we're just unsophisticated and... Um, have, you know, just foolish people. And so this is a, a society who has embraced evolution. And evolution has become its own religion. It truly has because people believe in it. And they worship it. They idealize it. Um, and it's just a philosophy that's posed as scientific fact when there's no fact at all. Listen, if God is not the creator, if God does not exist, if God is not here, Listen, this is the truth. Man becomes unaccountable for all of his actions. 
They can act irresponsible in any way that they choose to. And that's exactly what evolution does. In denying the sovereignty of God, his rights over his, our lives, his power over our lives, it gives free reign to everyone that chooses to believe this, to live to please themselves in any way that they want. Adultery, abortion, pornography, the denial that the family is an institution that God created, homosexuality, on and on and on. It just gives free reign to sin. Ultimately, it gives man an ex the, the excuse he was looking for, right? Genesis 1-1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Acts 14-15 says, We have come to bring you the good news that you should turn from the, the, these worthless things, these idols, all these other ways of worshiping. Turn to the Lord. That acknowledge that the Lord is God. He has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. This is the message we need to be bringing into the world as well. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He has made us. We are his. Now I want to send a challenge out there. If there be anyone in denial of God as the creator, let me challenge you right now. Let me challenge you to ask God to have a talk with God and say, if you're real, will you reveal yourself to me? If all these Christians have told me to believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, that you are the creator, show yourself if you're real. What are you afraid of to ask that? What are you afraid of? What do you have to lose to ask God to reveal himself to you? I challenge you to do it, and I would love to hear how he proves himself to you. I'd love to hear your experience about that. So feel free to get back to me. But I challenge you because God will prove to you if you're honestly seeking, if you ask him in all honesty. Verse 16 says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all are written, the days fashioned for me, when yet there was none of them. The Lord did more than design our, and form our bodies. He also planned and determined our days. Uh, one thing scripture tells us is that he has determined the length of our life. Job 14.5 says, A person's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits. He cannot exceed. We are trying to live as long as we can, or at least we, we should be taking care of ourselves to do that. But in the end, God has determined those days. And he also has determined the, the many tasks he has for us to perform in life. Not every last ta task to perform, but some are purposed in his heart. Titus 2.14 says, Who gave himself to us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed to purify, purify for himself his special people, zealous for good works. We'll hear more about that in a little bit. Now, some interpret, and in your book, they were, written, uh, they were written all the days fashioned for me, as yet there were none of them. Some interpret that as speaking of the formation of a tiny baby's body. And that is how they interpret, they, they kind of link that into the last passage. Um, one commentator, Clark, writes, all those members lay open before God's eyes. They were discerned by him as clearly as if the plan of them had been drawn in a book even to the last figuration of the body of the child in the womb. And so his belief is that that's, that's still talking about the creation of the body of the baby. But others interpret this portion of scripture to speak of the future days of this life that is yet unborn. So let's explore that thinking a little bit. The days fashion for me is, a, is the word yasar, Yasar, and it means through squeezing into shape. Uh, it also means determined, that very word determined. So God has determined our days. That means that he has predestined our lives. Job 42, 2 says, I know that you can do all things and that no plan or purpose of yours is thwart thwarted. So his purposes in our lives cannot be thwarted. They've been determined by God, and he will see to it that they are accomplished. 
He will be ever present in your life, bringing his plan to pass. And he will sort of be squeezing it into shape, right? Forming it. The picture David gives us here can be likened to an architect who is creating sketches or a draftsman as well, um, who created the sketches before the work or the, begi the building begins. They draw out those plans, and so then it, it gives the direction for the, the workmen to accomplish it. So it kind of gives that picture that he's writing it all down and he's determining it. God's predestination does not cancel out free will. Certain events are determined by God. And in his wisdom, in his omnipotent power, he will see to it that they come to pass. But on the other hand, there are certain decisions in our life that we have free will choice over, and that includes salvation. Salvation is 100% a free will choice, although he knows who is going to choose him, and um, in his foreknowledge it is clear to him, it is a choice. When, this is what you know, John 3.16, the verse that we all know so well says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever chooses to believe in him, which is implied within this statement, whoever believes in him or chooses to believe in him shall not perish but will have eternal life. So this verse supports the idea of a free will de decision in choosing salvation. Warren Wiersbe on this portion of scripture says, this is not some form of fatalism or heartless predestination for we are and what he, uh, for what we are and what he plans for us, it comes from the loving heart and the very best he has for us. So God isn't um, up there, you know, treating us like we're a bug and, you know, pulling off our limbs and, you know, you know, like he's experimenting with life, not at all. He has a portion of our life that he's predestined to go a particular way and good parts of our life where we're making our choices um, to surrender to his will. God has fashioned our days. And I don't know about you, but I think discovering what our purpose is is one of the most exciting parts of our lives, you know? Just finding it, what he has for us and his plan, you know, every part of it. it it's a beautiful process. Um, but honestly, our purpose is rarely flashy. <laughs> it's rarely um, showy or super public. I mean, we know that there are people out there that that is their life, but most of us will lead a quiet life. And that's not a bad thing at all. That's a good thing. We may not ever be well-known. Um, and it's really become the goal of many to become well-known now. Have you noticed that? <laughs> it's like we've got to have an online presence. You know, we want to get our name. We want to get our business going, all of that. It's become a huge goal. But is that God's plan for you? Is that God's purpose. We want to fall into his purpose because in his purpose is going to be the fullness of our joy, is it not? The fullness of our joy. There are things that are 100% God's purpose and desire for us, and I want to cover those things. Here's a short list of what plans God has included for you. God's plan for you includes knowing him. Knowing him is number one. John 17, 3 and this is the way to eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. And then Paul wrote in Philippians 3.8, I count all things loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, that I may gain Christ. So top of the list, the plan that God has included for you is to know him. And then God's plan for you includes glorifying him, using your life to bring his name praise and honor and glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, and I'm really really jazz that he include eating and drinking as a way I can bring him glory because I'm good at it. Just really like this is one of my the purposes. I just know it. <laughs> so whatever you do, whatever you do, eating or drinking, do all to the glory of God. And really the point of that is even at uh, the most everyday average thing you do in life should be done with intention that it might bring God glory. To be aware of what you're doing so that it could bring him glory, that you could choose that. 
And then Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. What's he created for you for? His glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. You were created for his glory. So that's part of his plan for your life. Think about that. Are you bringing him glory? Every day you have that opportunity to bring him glory. And then his plans for you include doing good. Doing good and, and doing acts of service. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we know he's got a plan of things that we're meant to do. And, and then those things are to be a blessing to the lives of others. And then Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine among men that they see your good works and, and give glory to your Father in heaven. So your good works not only you know, bring glory to, to God because you're doing them before him, but as others look on and see it, they're like, wow, that is a tremendous God they serve because they can see that our motivation to do the good works is because of him not to earn our way to heaven, not to get brownie points, not to look good, but because we're doing it because of him and as, as a response of love. So his plan for you is to do good works, acts of service, and then, it, then also his plan includes you to use your gifts. We could do any kind of good work. We could take the trash out for somebody. Almost all of us can do that. <laughs> we're capable. Talents are something special. Talents are something that are given to us very individually and very uniquely. And so there, there's something that we're meant to use. First Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God, uh, of God's grace in its various forms. And so we're meant to use our gifts and our talents to glorify God and to be a blessing to others. I think of my husband because he's a very handy guy. He has a lot of gifts and talents, way more than I do. But out in our neighborhood, he's always helping our neighbors. And doing, you know, he'll see them needing help and he'll step in and offer to help. They call him over to help now. Um, whatever it might be, um, he uses his skills for them and he's home a lot more so he's able to do that. So it's really awesome. I think of Christy's husband, Tom, who's a skilled dude too. And he came out and he gave my husband a hand. And, he, you know, it was hard work. It was, it was kind of back-breaking work. And man, having two instead of one out there doing it, it was a blessing. So he did really, you know, talk about service and good deeds. He did that and used some of his, his brain power as well, some skill. Um, man, we're meant to do that and go beyond just our own families, but into our neighborhoods, you know, into our communities and use those gifts and talents for the Lord. And then one more. God has plan, his plan includes for you to be conformed into the image of Christ. It's his great desire that you become more and more like Jesus, Romans 8, 29, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We're all meant to be moving more and more into Christ likeness. And I challenge you to let God touch your heart where he's convicting you to bring the change. He can bring the change. You just surrender to it. Say yes to him in it, and he will change you. Then you will be fulfilling your purpose on this world, in this earth, and that is part of your purpose. He has many purposes for your life. I want you to release any pre preconceived ideas you have. Sometimes we hang tight to, like, this is what I'm meant to be, this is what I'm going to become, and God's going, yeah, I have something completely different, and you're, like, really stalling and hindering the work because you're hanging on to it. Be open. Ask for it. Ask for revelation. Show me, lead me, guide me. Put it, the passion in my heart, and then move toward those things, and God will bless you. I really became a Bible teacher because of praying those kind of prayers all those years ago when I was younger. And he gave me, like, I just noticed it, like, I love the word, like, crazy. Like, I just, I didn't understand it, don't get me wrong. I mean, I did not understand it. I was just trying to figure out, what does this mean? But everything I could figure out by opening up an English dictionary and learning from that, 
That's how I started. Then someone showed me a concordance, how you could look up the words and what they meant in the original language. I'm like, this is crazy. And it just started popping and popping. I would read great concordances of great Bible teachers and listen to all kind of Bible teachers. I would go to a tape lending library. Yes, cassette tapes. <laughs> And I would visit, and I had to go well, the, where the church was and where this tape lending library was. Like here it's in a city, and the tape lending library was in the desert. It was like, why is it here? Like there's nothing. It was strange, really strange. But I don't care. I drove my little Honda Civic over there, and I listened to tape after tape, lots of tapes from Greg Laurie. And I just fed myself, and the word just became a passion for me. And it was, you know, became kind of, I guess, obvious to others because they're like, coming to me, asking me questions, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, I just studied that. I literally just studied that, and I had an answer for them. And then my pastor and pastor's wife took me aside and said, we want you to start teaching a Bible study. It was just something God put inside of me, and it, it became my own private passion that he eventually brought forward. Yours could be something completely different than that, completely different, but it's God. It's a calling. It doesn't, it's, there's spiritual callings, there's practical callings, there's callings for your work, there's callings in motherhood and grandmotherhood. There's so many callings. Man, we could literally stifle what he might want to do if we will just be open to what he might have. It might be so different than you ever imagined. Be open to what he has for you because he has a plan. And when we want to lean on our preconceived ideas, we can be led in frustration disappointment and content. You know what? Esther could have never guessed that her purpose was to become a queen in order to save Israel from annihilation. Joseph could not have imagined his purpose would be to store food, rise up in power, store food so he could feed all of Israel and his family. Joseph couldn't have imagined that in Rahab. Think of her. Her purpose for herself was so low. But God elevated her purpose, didn't he, to be used in her family's life to be saved from destruction, but not only that, to be part of the lineage of Christ. God elevates our purpose than we would ever elevate for ourselves. John the Baptist was called to proclaim the gospel and the coming of the Messiah. His purpose was fulfilled in his death, I'm sure he never knew that that would be, it would cost him his life, and yet he fulfilled the most highest calling in serving Christ that way. How about Deborah? She didn't elevate herself as a leader when the men of Israel wouldn't step up to the plate to lead. That was God's divine purpose for her. Ladies, let God lead you by the Holy Spirit. Let him unfold what your purpose is the ones that he has for you. And when you find out it's beyond you, <laughs> he will stretch you. And when you find out it's a sacrificial purpose, he will humble your heart and give you a heart to do it. When it's so big, it challenges your faith, he will grow your faith. If it hurts, if that calling he gives you hurts, he will strengthen you and he will be your healer. And if it's scary, and you're shaking in your boots, and I used to literally shake. Yeah, especially back when I used to play the guitar, it was actually scarier doing worship. It was more intimidating and frightening to me, and I remember shaking. He will make you brave. We have a God who supports his purpose in us and will help us accomplish it. Never have a case of raw, so raw attitude. What will be will be. Whatever is going to happen is going to happen. Look, God is going to guide you to his plan, but he wants you to have a heart of cooperation with it. He wants you to join with him in unity and move forward into it to accomplish. Romans 12.1 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, to God, which is a reasonable service. In other words, give your very being to him. Give it to him. Put yourself on an altar and say, here I am, God. Do with me as you please. That's what Jesus did, and that's what he's calling us to do. And the more we surrender our life to him, the more he can move in and really give Bring us to where he wants us. 
I don't care what age you are right now, there's more for you. If you're at the beginning and you're young, or if you're older like me, or even beyond that, God's not finished with you. He has purposes and plans to fulfill, and we just need more surrender to say yes, guide me, lead me, and to, just to, to receive his bravery to, and courage to do it. Now let's go to verse 17. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand, and when I awake, I am still with you. We're almost there. David shares this insight about the heart of God towards you, that his thoughts are set upon you. They are not now and again. They are not here and there. <laughs> they are consistent. They are constant. They are continual. They are ceaseless. They are incessant thoughts, like the sand of the sea. You know how our mind races to the one that we're in love with, and you just can't stop thinking about him? person who you love or adore, who you cherish. God is incessantly thinking of you like that in the most beautiful way. When we sleep, when we sleep, we rarely think of God. Maybe we have an occasional dream that he's involved in, but when we awake, we're aware his presence has not left us for a second. That's what David is saying. More than that, God's constant thoughts toward us imply that he is unrelentingly involved in our lives. Psalm 121, verse 1 expounds, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord. This is his involvement. His, our help comes from the Lord, who has made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel, and you can put your name in there, Israel, who, 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 he, he who keeps Vanita, he who keeps Vanita shall never, never slumber nor sleep. God is with us at all times, actively involved in our lives. Now, I just want to ask you, how do you imagine God's thoughts of you? How do you think he thinks about you? Do you think that he's thinking harsh thoughts? judgmental thoughts? Are they angry thoughts towards you? Do you feel he's disappointed with you? Maybe that his thoughts are far and few in between. It's very important. Not just that we grasp that he's continually thinking of us, but that he's continually thinking of us with the sweetest love. Because if we don't, then we're not going to have a true understanding of who God is, and it's not going to lead us to the proper conclusion of his love for us. This is going to wipe us out. The enemy can just take advantage of you and pick you off so fast if you don't get that he is thinking of you constantly. Thoughts of love. It's going to lead you uh, astray and give you a skewed lens. I want you to clean the lenses of your mind so that you know you are loved. In fact, David says that his thoughts toward you are precious, and that means that they are weighty and of high value. They're of high value. You need not th fear that he's thinking the worst of you. Even when he sees the worst, he's not thinking of, of the worst because he's thinking of you the best with the highest aim through the lens of the blood of Christ and through his love. Spurgeon writes this, thinking of his thoughts. His thoughts such are as natural to the creator, the preserver, the redeemer, the father, the friend. They are evermore flowing from the heart of the Lord. Thoughts of your pardon, your renewal, your upholding, your supplying, your educating, perfecting, and a thousand kinds of thoughts perpetually well up in the mind of the Most High. We all know Jeremiah 29, 11. It was written to the Jews, and it is extended to us. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And Psalm 40, verse 5, Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works, which you have done. And he's, the psalmist is writing of the things that God has done for him and for his nation. Many are the wonderful works you've done. 
and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, there would be too many to number. That is the thoughts of your gods towards you. They are thoughts of love. I hope that as we're going through Psalm 139, you will receive these scriptures as a love letter to you because they are a love letter to your soul. They are the very words of God from the very heart of God. He planned you. He made you. He's watching over you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And he has a purpose for you. It's a rich purpose. His desire is that you would cooperate with him so that those purposes could be fulfilled. You were fearfully and wonderfully made, and that my soul knows very well. Let's pray. Father, I feel like I'm just reading a love letter from you to my heart, and I'm blown away. I can't believe you thought of me so many times. I despise my own self because I know what I ought to be and I fail to be it. And to know that you, you find me precious, that your thoughts are constantly on me to lift me up, to strengthen me, to help me, to change me that you thought of me from the beginning of time knowing that you'd send Jesus to wash away all my sin, make me new before you that I could know you. I know I'm not the only one that feels unworthy. But Lord, I receive your imparted word that I am loved, I am forgiven, I have a purpose, I'm not a mistake, <laughs> I'm not an afterthought. I thank you that when my father and mother forsake me, you take me up. And I thank you, God. I pray, I pray for my sisters here. I pray for anyone who has the opportunity to hear this message that you would reveal their purpose, their, the plans that you have prepared for them. And you would just soften their heart to work and cooperate with you to see them come to pass, that we would fulfill our best life in Christ. And Lord, even if our purposes are quiet, even if they're behind the scenes, that we would find great delight and joy that you've made this plan for us. So we give our hearts afresh to you, and we praise you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Enjoy.